Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Terry McDonald, Executive Director of the St. Vincent de Paul Society of Lane County. McDonald had ser has served St. Vincent de Paul for over 50 years, 37 as Executive Director. He is an alumnus of the University of Oregon, having earned a bachelor's degree in history and political science and a master's degree in education. Thanks, Terry, for coming on the show. It's a, it's a real uh, privilege to talk to you today. It's a real pleasure to be here. So tell us first a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved with St. Vinny de Paul. Uh, it was blatant nepotism. Uh, my father was the first director of St. Vinny de Paul and started the organization here in the 1950s uh, and served in that role until his death in 1984. Uh, I uh, was uh, finishing up college at uh, the university in 1971 uh, and uh, was thinking about what to do with my life. And uh, he decided to say, well, he, he wondered if I could cover uh, the office for a couple of weeks while he went on vacation. Actually, it was a couple of months. And I said, will you pay me? And he said, yeah. And I said, oh, OK, fine, I'll do it. Because I didn't have anything else going on. Couldn't decide whether to get a law degree or something else. Uh, and um, Basically, since I've been raised around the industry, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be interesting to find out if you could take this business, which was the thrift industry business, and convert it into a real uh, powerful tool for social change in the community? And so uh, after uh, thinking about it for a while, I thought, well, let's see if we could take this car and spin it out for a while. You've already started to answer my next question. What's unique about St. Vincent de Paul and Lane County among nonprofits? Why, what, what's special about your model? Well, uh, we make our own money, uh, which is kind of unusual. And we also integrated the organization to where the money-making portion of the organization supports the non-money-making portion of the organization, not just with money, uh, but with infrastructure and support. Uh, and so that model is somewhat unique. And it was uh, based upon a problem we have in the 1980s. Uh, the 1980s uh, was a period of time when there was a significant economic downturn. Uh, there was more need than we could possibly fill. Uh, we needed resources. Uh, and uh, the agency, of course, didn't have those resources to put out. Uh, so as an organization, we said we need to address three things. We need to address the need for permanent long-term employment. Uh, we need to address the need for emergency services and support for those emergency services. And we needed affordable housing. Uh, and where are you going to get the resources? And we chose to look uh, into what we already knew, which was the thrift industry, but unusual places in the thrift industry, meaning transfer sites and dumps. Uh, and uh, we started pillaging dumps uh, from as far away as uh, San Francisco and to the south and Portland to the north. and as far east as Edinburgh and Scotland, uh, pulling product out of dumps that would have normally uh, been uh, landfilled or incinerated. Um, and uh, they were perfectly usable and returning them to this place uh, to create the vast number of stores that we have right now. So let's talk about first the array of services that St. Vincent de Paul provides. So you mentioned your services uh, to help underemployed or unemployed people. So tell us about your the efforts that you use to support uh, people seeking employment. Well, uh, normally, of course, it would be a, a little different marketplace. Right now, there's so full employment uh, that uh, anybody that could walk in a door or slither underneath the carpet could probably get a job. Uh, but uh, we deal with people with multiple barriers to employment. Uh, Ex-offenders or refugee populations are particularly uh, uh, good targets for us of people that are uh, needing to get a work history or else to uh, regain their work history. Uh, and we are able to hire those folks in a variety of positions, also offer vertical integration and opportunities for advancement up through the organization. Uh, and that's just on the job side. On the emergency services side, of course, we run the homeless programs uh, basically for all of uh, uh, this area. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the um, uh, city of Eugene uh, just honored our emergency services department with the community service award this year. Um, and uh, we also do the family family, uh, the family shelter programs, uh, family respite programs for homeless families, uh, veterans housing programs, veterans um, supportive housing, uh, then the Egan warming centers, uh, food box programs, 
uh, affordable housing, of course, a variety of uh, housing types, everything from SRO housing up to permanent affordable housing uh, and home ownership and rental rehabilitation or uh, rehabilitation programs for rural housing, a variety of things. Uh, we serve about 80,000 people a year. <clears throat> How many affordable housing units have been developed? 1,600. Incredible, incredible. And you also provide self-sufficiency services. What are those? Well, self-sufficiency services are the ones where you uh, give people financial literacy, uh, develop uh, their um, uh, saving programs uh, and help them uh, uh, with the, whatever uh, they need in terms of support uh, to um, make themselves viable in the long-term in the community. You also um, have assistance programs specifically aimed at veterans. You wanna tell us about those? So we have the Vet Lift program, uh, which is uh, dealing with homeless veterans that are on the street uh, and uh, have very, um, uh, very poor support systems around them uh, and find them placement in housing. Uh, we have our own permanent affordable uh, veterans housing programs uh, uh, in the downtown area of Eugene for about 40 homeless veterans. That's more permanent respite for uh, veterans who are never going to be viable on their own need a lot of support services associated with them. Then there's our SSVF program, Supported Services for Veterans Families, where we find uh, veteran families, get them reintegrated back into the community uh, and provide them with basically with a Section 8 voucher and we get them affordable housing in the community. We do about, well, we did about 200 to 250 of those uh, homeless families or individuals last year, veteran families. Um, and then there's also the case management. Uh, many of our veterans need supported services in the long term. Uh, they often suffer from PTSD uh, and other, other issues. Uh, and uh, so we need to have an ongoing support system for them. We work very closely with the VA on all that. You also provide services for youth. Tell us about those. Well, uh, of course, there's Child Care Center at First Place Family Center, but there's also the Homeless uh, uh, Girls Youth House uh, in South Eugene. Uh, a, a 13 unit uh, apartment, it's actually a converted church uh, that we developed uh, that offers for homeless teens under the age of uh, 18, uh, the opportunity to have a safe uh, place to live with uh, uh, supported services around it. And the hope is that they will stay in school uh, so that they will be able to finish and matriculate rather than uh, end up with a life on the street. So let's talk a little bit about the other side of uh, all, all that you do, which is the thrift uh, business side and uh, all your efforts at recycling and manufacturing. Tell us about some of those. Uh, well, of course, the thrift industry is a robust industry uh, and it's one that uh, supports uh, a lot of nonprofits around the country. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, of course, has their restores. Goodwill have their stores. Salvation Army has their stores. In our area, Teen Challenge, uh, CARA, and other organizations support their charitable activities on whatever their particular bent is uh, by the resale of these goods that are given to them by their constituents. Uh, in our particular circumstance, we've kind of done that on steroids. Uh, and uh, it's what we've chosen to do is to say, look, you, we don't care where the stuff comes from. So if it comes from a dump in Scotland, I don't care. If it comes from a dump in San Francisco, I don't care. As long as we can get it here cost effectively. And by cost effectively, we do a lot of intermodal transportation uh, where you end up with a 40 foot or a 53 foot container, uh, bring that product from wherever it is into this place. Uh, it's a very, very low carbon footprint and with a very high yield. Um, so that has fed us a lot of materials that we can put into our stores. Uh, and we have 12 stores uh, that uh, are scattered around Oregon, uh, and which has allowed us, of course, then to um, have that as both a job placement as well as a revenue center and also access to products. Uh, so, for example, uh, when we needed to set up the um, safe uh, parking program uh, here about a month ago uh, in cooperation with the city of Eugene, uh, we have places where people can safely park their vehicles, 55 vehicles, uh, but they have to have a place where they can get out and, and socialize, you just leave people in their trucks or vehicles, it's not going to be very good for them. Uh, and we need to outfit that. So our stores provided all of the furnishings for those um, various safe spots 
basically little cabins uh, where people can congregate. Uh, and all of that came uh, largely from um, retailers that uh, give us their surplus materials uh, from um, uh, new materials that uh, they, couldn't, they, they couldn't sell on their own. Uh, and so it's a very good symbiotic relationship between them. Uh, in terms of other programs, of course, um, we uh, about 20 years ago uh, got into the mattress recycling business. Uh, and that's an interesting story all of its own. Uh, the, um, what we knew was that uh, in dealing with transfer sites and dumps in California was as if there was a crying need to have mattresses removed from their system because in the California, it's a state mandate that they have a decrease the amount of materials going into landfill year after year. And it's not like Oregon where it's a voluntary mandate. It's a mandate that has teeth. Uh, so if a district does not meet their diversion totals, uh, and this has been going on for 30 years, if they don't meet their diversion totals, they will be fined by the state. Well, mattresses were one of the target areas because they make up about 1% of the waste stream uh, by volume in California. Uh, and so if somebody could figure out a way to recycle mattresses that would allow those districts to meet their mandated goals. Uh, so we were called on to develop the first commercially viable mattress recycling operation in the world, uh, which we did uh, after a much, uh, uh, much pain and suffering. Uh, and uh, for about 10, uh, 15 years, we processed mattresses in a facility in Oakland, California. Uh, the state of California followed a national trend of doing a product stewardship bill for mattress uh, recycling uh, in 2015. And so for the last six years, we've been uh, working with the Mattress Recycling Com uh, Council in California, the nonprofit that runs their mattress stewardship program and has set up three facilities to process up to about 40,000 mattresses per month. Uh, there are many other things. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what is entailed in processing a mattress for, for recycling. Well, about 80 to 85% of a mattress can be recycled. Uh, and so if you think about how a mattress is typically built, uh, they have a topper, which is a quilted top with polyurethane foam and the uh, ticking on it sewn together. Uh, that's removed uh, using the uh, terrorist weapon of choice, a box cutter, uh, and uh, set aside. And that goes back to commercial carpet pads. So uh, that stuff is chopped up and uh, with other polyurethane uh, foam and put into the backing material for commercial carpets. Uh, the next layer is usually a layer of polyurethane foam itself. Uh, that's chopped up and put into um, a residential carpet pad, that kind of marbly looking carpet pad you buy at uh, Jerry's or Lowe's or wherever else. Uh, under that is typically cotton. Uh, cotton goes back to LEED certified insulation made, a, a, made up in a company down in Prescott, Arizona, uh, treated with borax so it's fire retardant and goes into LEED certified housing. Uh, underneath that is an endurolator pad. It's a pad made up of uh, recycled clothing that is bonded together uh, to create a thick pad to separate the soft material from the springs. That gets thrown away. Uh, we have found no secondary use for that product. Uh, and finally, there's the springs themselves. Those are shredded uh, or baled and put into the steel industry. Uh, it's very much a similar story with a box spring, you know, similar materials until you get to the wood. The wood is shredded and put into a soil uh, compost in, into um, uh, amendment, the soil amendments. Uh, and that's what, that's what happens to a mattress. <laughs> Completely fascinating. Um, you also do a lot of recycling of glass. Tell us about the creation of Aurora Glass. Aurora Glass was an idea of ours in the 1990s when we went up to Portland and saw a large mountain of glass outside of the Corning, uh, Owens Corning uh, facility out by the airport. And we thought, well, if there's that much glass, it's got to be profiting in it somewhere. Uh, and uh, quickly decided that bottle glass was not the glass that we wanted to deal with. Uh, we wanted to deal with um, uh, window glass. Uh, and window glass is not typically recycled. Now, glass, there's many different types of glass, but the characteristics of window glass uh, were such that, um, that they make it very desirable for small batch manufacturing like we do. Uh, and uh, so if you're going to make a bottle, uh, you want that glass to set immediately. So you don't want to have it setting a long time. But if you're making a window, you want it to be rolled out and to stay viscous 
so that you can work it for an extended period of time which is perfect for a small batch operation like we do where we hand press out the glass items. Uh, and so that's how we got started doing that uh, with a, a 500 pound day tank. Uh, that facility had to shutter a couple of years ago when we moved out of our Broadway facility where it was, uh, uh, had been running for about uh, 25 years and we're currently relocating it. So tell us about your the position of in-house artists that you have. Why did you why did you think to do that? Well, so same as Nepal, any thrift operation gets a lot of materials that are unusual. Uh, and uh, so there's the typical things that people give you, you know, you have regular clothes and shoes, belts, purses, and whatever else. Um, and what we found is, is that uh, much of that material has secondary value as the material it was or else to be recreated into something else. Uh, and so we have found over the years that there's a continuous demand for uh, uh, jean skirts, for example. Uh, and, and there's no reason why you can't make them up. It's just a matter of, you know, if you get something with blown out knees, uh, you can cut that up and turn it into a jean skirt. And that's been a very continuous line for us. Um, but Mitra Grinnell, who uh, was our fashion designer, uh, came on board and has helped us uh, uh, over the years uh, create a whole different line of various products. The key to it we found was making sure that you tested the product, not by selling it online, but having a retail operation that was specifically targeted for this type of material, an upcycled or an unusual clothing material. Uh, and that was at our Aurora building uh, in downtown Eugene. Uh, the pandemic closed that uh, because it was too small a footprint um, for us to continue the operation in a very small location. And so we're looking at reconstruct reconstructing that after we get done with the pandemic. The pandemic has just made the boutique business impossible. So tell us a little bit more about the impacts of COVID-19 on, on uh, St. Vincent's de Paul. Well, COVID-19, of course, as with all retailers back in March of 19 or of 2020, uh, shut the entire retail operation down. And uh, Basically, that meant that the money-making part of St. Vincent de Paul um, was immediately chopped off, uh, and it was chopped off for a couple of months. Uh, and so you know, we, uh, we suddenly saw a $50,000 a day hole in our budget developed. Uh, and, um, and how do you deal with that? Uh, well, first of all, you lay off a lot of people. Uh, and we were not, by the way, eligible for any of the federal assistance or the PPP or whatever else, uh, because we were too large. We fit into a category of businesses that didn't get any support. Those businesses had more than 500 employees, but less than a thousand. Uh, and so uh, there was no support for us during that period of time. Uh, and so as what we did was that we did lay off a lot of people, uh, 300, 300 people, uh, but we also pivoted to going online more. Uh, so we moved rapidly to expanding our online book presence uh, from selling about $3,000 worth of books a day uh, to selling almost $9,000 worth of books a day uh, to help fill in some of that hole. Uh, we also pivoted to putting more product that was uh, uh, jewelry and assorted items, high value, high ticket items online uh, so that we could then go ahead and continue to have some operations. The other thing we did was is that we pivoted the staff, a lot of them, especially the management staff, uh, over into the homeless shelter programs. So when the COVID-19 hit, what was necessary was that many of the mass shelters like at the mission or any place else had to be socially distanced. And so the people in those programs had to be put into other places. So the county came to us uh, on March 4th, 15th, 2020 and said, how quickly could you set up uh, a, a couple of mass shelters uh, that would be socially distant uh, for about 200 to 250 homeless people uh, in Springfield, 50 and 150 in Eugene at the fairgrounds. How quickly could you set it up? And of course, that was just during the time I was laying off my staff in the stores. And I said, well, I have the staffing for it. Uh, and we also have the infrastructure because I can pillage the stores and get the bedding and you know, all the rest of the stuff that we needed. And we set those shelters up in 48 hours. Uh, so. Uh, it was a way for us to pivot very quickly to retain staff 
and as again, that's where how you flow things back and forth inside of this organization, take advantage of the infrastructure and trucking, and also have the ability to continue our production areas, which were needed to do deal with the laundry and the bedding and the clothing and whatever else for those homeless shelters and homeless programs, not only for ours, but others. Uh, and in one circumstance, uh, up in the Dalles, where we have a store, uh, we were asked by the local hospital to get them scrubs and, and uh, uh, personal protective supplies, which we were able to take from our stores, ship up to, uh, to the, the Dalles, to their hospital, to make sure that they had sufficient material for them to process. It's an integrated type of a system. Everything feeds on each other. So you've, you've, you just mentioned that you have over 500 staff, but under 1,000. How many staff does St. Vincent de Paul? 700. And tell us about the process by which former clients get involved in the employment. You are also an employment agency in a sense. Say a little bit about that aspect of what you do. Well, of course, what we do is uh, we want to encourage people to uh, increase their uh, financial ability always, uh, and that requires increasing skills. And so we have a lot of really entry level jobs, tactile hands-on jobs, whether it's mattress recycling or whether it's processing materials or whatever else, uh, we have a lot of that, but then we also ask people if they want to advance the side of the organization that they should increase their skills. So if you want to be a CDL driver, we'll help support that effort. If you want to be a forklift operator, we have our in-store training. If you want to be a welder, we'll help you on that program. Uh, so the idea is, is to help people increase their skills level. And if they decide to move on to other organizations, great. If they want to stay inside of the organization, that's fine as well. Uh, so an example uh, of that uh, would be um, uh, the, the woman that for many years was the um, uh, director of our stores operation, now she's in charge of personnel, uh, was, came to us as a 19-year-old uh, uh, single head of household with two children. Her first child she had when she was 14. Uh, and um, she started off as a clerk and then she moved up through the organization to where she ran all of my stores operation. Now she runs the personnel side. Uh, another gentleman came to me that runs my mattress recycling operations. Uh, he came to me uh, out of uh, incarceration uh, where he was in, had just been released uh, on a conviction for manslaughter. Uh, and he now runs a mattress recycling operation or a mattress rebuilding program. Uh, so people can integrate and move up through the organization as well as move on into other areas. But we always try to keep track of folks to can encourage and help them as they move through life. Do you have other staff who are formerly incarcerated? Is that a, a crucial part of what you do or is that just occasionally the case? Well, I'll be honest with you. Some of my best employees are ex-offenders. Uh, so the current director of stores operations is an ex-offender. Uh, you know, many of my staff in California, the mattress and cycle operations are ex-offenders coming out of incarceration. Um, uh, I, I find that ex-offenders ex uh, especially folks that are in for serious crime, uh, are excellent employees when they get out on the backside. And the, and the good news about that is that they generally tell you if they're serious about staying out of jail uh, or going back very quickly. Uh, so if you've been in uh, jail for a number of years and you've decided you want to do something different, uh, you generally are really committed to that. And that organization that is willing to take the risk on you, you're generally pretty loyal to it. So tell us how your model has been emulated among nonprofits across the country. Have other nonprofits in other places tried to imitate what you do? Well, uh, we were approached about 10 years ago by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation out of uh, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, to uh, see if, if we could replicate our model with other nonprofits around the country. And uh, in that first iteration, uh, they said, we'd like to see if we could replicate that mattress recycling. Uh, and so uh, we went ahead and helped two organizations on the East Coast, um, the, uh, Greater Bridgeport Community Development Corporation and uh, the Mustard Seed in Orlando, Florida, a furniture bank, uh, tool up for mattress recycling. Uh, and, uh, and as a result of that, uh, uh, in, Con in Connecticut, uh, which is where Greater Bridgeport uh, Community Development Corporation is, they are the largest mattress recycler in the Northeast. Uh, and we were very successful uh, under stewardship of Adrian Well, who is an outstandingly interesting human being and a delight to be with. Uh, 
And uh, after that first iteration, the RWJ came back and said, we'd like to see you do more of this. And I said, okay, fine, we'll do a lot more, but, but I wanna do something other than just mattress recycling. I'd like to bring all the tools to place, whether it's online book sales or online media sales or retail thrift or automobiles or anything else, because we have our own car lot. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they funded that, and uh, we created the Cascade Alliance, a grouping of about 15 nonprofits around the United States that are interested in creating permanent jobs uh, to support their charitable mission uh, and uh, to raise revenue for them uh, in a sustainable manner based on waste stream diversion. Absolutely fascinating. Um, do you have any, it's a brand new year. Uh, we're just at the start of 2022. Do you have any particular goals? For this year? Well, uh, it depends on which, you know, I have always had multiple goals. Uh, so, so uh, one is, is that we're, we're hoping that the state of Oregon will adopt the product stewardship measure being introduced by Senator Manning uh, and uh, get into the mattress recycling business throughout the state of Oregon. Because basically we'd like to set up, we already have a facility here in Eugene that does mattress recycling for Lane County and other parts of the state. But we'd like to have it in a more orderly fashion. So Senator Manning is going to introduce that measure. If it passes, uh, then we will have a mattress stewardship program in Oregon. We'll set up, well, we already got one facility in Eugene, but we'd probably set one up by Portland uh, to increase that outreach for mattresses. And then we're working in the state of Washington to do the same thing there. So the idea is to basically allow St. St. Paul to have facilities in Oregon, Washington, California to do mattress recycling, linking all those pieces together with our trucking fleet because we have a trucking fleet with about 400 trailers and eight tractors moving product up and down through the waste streams of, of the West Coast uh, and integrate those together. Uh, we're also working on an interesting program for um, diverting, uh, for recycling the ammonia in RV uh, refrigerators, uh, uh, recreational vehicle refrigerators or very old systems that have ammonia uh, and uh, ammonia recycling, uh, out of, out of appliances, out of refrigerators uh, is somewhat hazardous because of the high pressure ammonia in those systems. Uh, we're working with the Dutch on a, a product that they would recycle that product and uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get that in operation. I'd like to double the size of our styrofoam recycling operation. We're doing about two tons of polystyrene a month now. I'd like to see that double up to about four tons. Uh, but as we get more waste streams on board, we'll be able to do some of that, uh, increase that volume. So on that side of it, uh, we're looking at reconstituting and, and doing some more outreach and more development of the waste-based businesses that will be sustainable. We're already doing pretty well on the CFCs. Um, last month alone, we recycled uh, and basically removed from the waste stream uh, 1, 000, no, 3,500 pounds of CFC gases, uh, which we sold off to a company in Texas which is a whole different story on how you clean gas and all that. It's a fractional distillation process. Anyhow, that's down, that's kind of beside the point. Uh, so that's one goal. Um, on the affordable housing side, you know, we just finished Iris Place, uh, uh, 53 unit apartment complex, a section 42 tax credit deal at River Road, affordable housing for low income families at 50% of median income and below. Uh, we're working on developing a uh, eight unit apartment complex out uh, off of South Eugene, uh, off of West Amazon, which will be for homeless families associated with our annex out there and a 10 unit apartment complex uh, on Green Lane for homeless family or homeless veterans uh, that will be developed this year. Uh, and we're looking at uh, expanding our efforts into mobile home parks, uh, more of them. We have eight mobile home parks scattered throughout the state of Oregon. And we're trying to replace more and more of those old pre-76 units with more modern units. Uh, we're very pleased with the performance of our solar program associated with the Saginaw Mobile Home Park, where we have a large solar display out there. Uh, and that is decreasing the cost of the utilities for the people that live in the park pretty dramatically. We'd like to expand that solar access uh, to more families and more people out there to decrease the cost of our low-income families that are living in these parks. Um, so uh, that's part of what's going on. Uh, we'd very also like to very much move uh, into more modular housing. Uh, we know that the homeless issues in our community are growing and likely to grow more. Uh, you can't build regular stick housing fast enough. Uh, so I prefer to deal with uh, manufactured housing. Uh, 
uh, and finding a way to do that cost effectively and probably trying to set up a facility to manufacture it in the state of Oregon is one of the goals that not only I, but the governor has. Uh, so we'd like to see that push forward on that side. Uh, we're working on developing two new stores. Uh, so on the retail side, I'm looking at uh, developing a store on Broadway Street in Bonita, and then one on an undisclosed location in Cottage Grove. So we'd be able to increase our retail footprint on that particular side of things. Uh, and um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, 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 there's always other stuff, but you know, that's enough. Oh, that's amazing, amazing array of things. It's just mind boggling. Um, Terry, we're just about at the end of our time. This will be my last question. How can our viewers help St. Vincent de Paul? How can they get involved? Well, uh, of course, there's always the multiple ways. Uh, so uh, Egan Warming Centers always need volunteers. Uh, we run the Egan Warming Centers, the Winter West Respite. That's an important function. Uh, you can always, when, if we could ever get past the pandemic, if we could ever get past the pandemic, uh, First Place Family Center, the Lindholm Center, always need volunteers associated with their various programs, whether it's food boxes or child care uh, or the uh, interfaith emergency shelter system to help homeless families, you know, sleep at the annex out of South Eugene. That's always a place for people to go. Supporting the Girls Youth House uh, through um, outreach services to those homeless youth. And by that, I mean, if you have some skill, and again, this has to be after the pandemic, we're trying to not put people at risk. Uh, but once we can get through this thing, we always look for mentors for these young women so that they would be able to have good role models so that they'd remove, uh, be able to have some family in their lives uh, because they're, they're homeless themselves right now. Uh, and uh, that's an interesting area to support us. Uh, obviously, uh, I always believe that uh, it's important to let your state legislators know that sustainable economies are very important, that product stewardship measures are extremely valuable, uh, and I'd like to see those supported. Uh, so whether it's mattress recycling or it's recycling of other materials, carpet would be a good target for in the future. Uh, big bulky items that could be removed from the waste stream cost effectively if we did a product storage measure. Uh, that's important being engaged with that. It's important to also think about the long-term impacts of climate change and how we're going to be more resilient as a community. I would prefer to be thinking ahead instead of thinking in back. And that means, you know, decreasing the bio load and making sure that we have uh, the safe communities in terms of fire and, and flood. Uh, those are important functions. You can always send me money. I'll take money anytime. And I'll also take your stuff. <laughs> well, Terry, um, thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks for uh, telling us about everything that St. Vincent de Paul does. And thanks for all that you do to make it succeed. And thanks to all your staff and your clients do to make it a success. It's just been fascinating and, and uh, illuminating to talk to you today. A pleasure, thank you very much. I've been speaking with Terry McDonald, Executive Director of the St. Vincent de Paul Society of Lane County. Thanks so much for watching.